listening to Conversing the Classics. Today we are discussing the Greek city-state residing on the banks of the Eurotas River in the southern Peloponnese. Its brutality, xenophobia and harsh military discipline has captured the imagination of politicians, filmmakers and schoolboys alike. If you haven't already guessed, today we are discussing the history, culture and legacy of the city-state of Sparta. Today's episode is really quite special because I'm no longer in Dublin, or even in Ireland for that matter. Instead, I've hopped on a plane and ambled my way over to Clare College in Cambridge. And joining me today to discuss Sparta is a man who needs no introduction and I must confess I'm a huge fan of his work. Mm. Paul Cartledge, A.G. Leventus Professor of Greek Culture Emeritus. He's written a host of books on Sparta, including Sparta and Epic History, After Thermopylae, as well as writing the notes and introduction for Tom Holland's translation of Herodotus. Professor Cartledge, I am honoured to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Oscar. So let's dive straight in because we've got quite a bit of history to get through today. Can we open up the discussion by talking a little about the founding myths of Sparta and the Homeric references to Lacedaemon? Right, I'll take those in uh, order. Mm. The basic myth of the foundation consists of uh, the idea that there were once upon a time descendants of Heracles who came back. In other words, they'd once been in the area where the Spartans historically mm. lived, southern Peloponnese. Yeah. But according to the myth, they had been booted out by a very unpleasant king, mm. and they had now come back. Mm. And then confused with that, or um, complementary to that myth, was the myth of the Dorians, the notion that a bunch of people from a place called Doris, which is in northern Greece, mm -hmm. had migrated southwards. And so, according to a version which you get in the 7th century BC poet Tertius, mm -hmm. the return of the Heraclids, the descendants of Heracles, was coincident with the migration of Dorians. Mm -hmm. Actually, what happened uh, is another question which perhaps we can come back to. Mm. Homeric references are slightly different because there you have um, a whole uh, context where you've got a king of Sparta, he's called Menelaus, mm. he's the brother of the high king of all the Greeks, mm. Agamemnon, and it's Menelaus' wife being nicked by Paris of Troy, mm. which is the Trojan story, mm. and so he is absolutely central, and Sparta and Lacedaemon are central. Mm -hmm. In Homer, Lacedaemon is the generic term for the region. Mm. within which there are various named places, and one of them, of course, is Sparta. Mm. But as it happens, in the historical period, Lacedaemon was used not only for the region, but also for the city. So the official name, as it were, of Sparta as a political entity was Lacedaemon. Mm. Now, is there any reality behind these myths or any truth to what the Homeric epic tells us about the early Lacedaemonians? And... Do we know what exactly are the earliest archaeological sites found and classified directly as Spartan? If we're to take seriously Homer, then once upon a time there was, a, as it were, a major king, and he was based somewhere in the region where historical Sparta was. And his name was Menelaus, but um, we can't prove that mm -hmm. until we have documents. And there are documents now being turned up about 10 to 15 kilometers south of Sparta. And this is where there was a late Bronze Age, we call it Mycenaean Palace, mm -hmm. of the, the high king yeah. of, of the region. But as yet, there is no name Menelaus. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about the um, late Bronze Age is that there were a number of sites the whole of um, what became the Spartans' territory, southeast Laconia and in southwest uh, Peloponnese, which is Messenia, there were lots and lots of Mycenaean sites, and it's a very important region. Mm. Somewhere around 1200 BC, something happens, and it's not unique to Sparta. Uh, it happens at Mycenae, it happens in Thebes, mm. but there is major destruction. Mm -hmm. And then there is a gap, there is a gulf, there is a sharp cultural break between seeming prosperity in the 13th century BC and then seeming, well, almost nothing in terms of archaeology, mm -hmm. no writing. Um, we tend to think of it as a dark age mm -hmm. by about 1100. And then things don't pick up until the 10th century BC. And so if you, you were to ask me historically, when was the city of Sparta 
found it, I would give you a date somewhere around 950 BC. And that feeds in quite well to the next question. You obviously mentioned earlier on that Heracles is where they trace their lineage right back to. But a little later than that, there's a character you hear quite a lot about in Spartan culture, and that is Lycurgus. Could you tell us a little bit about him and his his role? That's a very good question. He um, turns up in our earliest serious um, prose source about early Spartan history, that's Herodotus. And already by the time of Herodotus, middle of the 5th century BC, uh, Lycurgus is regarded as, as it were, the Jefferson, the Washington, the founding father of the Spartan state. And he's founded everything, the education system, the economic system with the helots, the military system, you know, the whole thing. Mm. However, go back, I mentioned Tertius mm. uh, in the 7th century, a Spartan writing about not only his own time but earlier history. Does he mention Lycurgus? He does not. Mm. And in Herodotus there's a famous passage where Spartans send a delegation to the Delphic Oracle Mm. and what they're asking is how should we regard Lycurgus our founding father was he a man or was he a god and the Delphic Oracle says I rather think he was a god so in other words historians like me have a very strong suspicion that Lycurgus is an invention Mm -hmm. to explain the fact that Sparta becomes quite early on a unified city with very distinctive features and customs, mm. such as no other city has. Mm-hmm. And so how do we explain it? I know one man comes along, a founding genius, who invents uh, a number of laws. Mm. In particular, he's regarded as a legislator. He's then given a genealogy. Because Sparta has two royal houses, he must have belonged to one of them. But unfortunately, the tradition, i.e. the different sources, sometimes put him in one royal house house Mm. sometimes in another so in other words another reason for thinking probably he's not historical okay so he's semi-fictitious but or possibly fully i mean we have little (laughs) things to know i think fully (laughs) um (laughs) but it is or at least the spartans claim that it's it's under him you called him a legislator i think is is quite a good word to use they that sparta begins to establish itself as um a military state could you Talk to us a little bit more about sort of how that happens or yeah. why is it's a military state. Yes, it's yeah. very well um, described as a conquest state, I think. There is an issue. I mean, why does any um, community decide to expand beyond its immediate territorial limits mm. and in the process to conquer a lot of other people who are mm. Greeks and then to subordinate them and then to decide we're going to hang on to this enlarged state? These are very different difficult questions, but one of the bases of that expansion must be a fairly secure, um, very well organized central space, Mm -hmm. and that is Sparta. And it must have um, its own rules, regulations, both political, economic, and social. Mm. So exactly how the, they came together, we can't say. What we think, historians think today, is that it had happened by about 700 BC or somewhere between 700 and 650. So mm. if there really was a Lycurgus, he would have been active somewhere in the early part of the 7th mm. century BC. Now, we talked about them as a, a military state, but they are very, very famous or infamous in, in some <laughs> cases for their disciplinary code and training. In the myths, why does Lycurgus decide to turn it into a military state? Because that is going to be the basis of Spartan power. But before they can go out and conquer, they have, first of all, to establish their uh, institutions. And there are two features of Lycurgus's supposed legislation, which are the most important. One is education. Mm -hmm. The other is economic. He supposedly said to the Spartans, right, you've got to treat the whole of the conquest land as common property, Mm -hmm. and you've got to 
divided up into a number of allotments, plots, mm. and on each of them there will be a certain number of unfree um, people. They're Greeks, and the Spartans came to call them helots. Mm. So having organized that system, he then gets the Spartans, this is, I'm saying he, and mm. this is what the myth has, mm. gets them to live communally in the central space. They belong to military-style messes, barracks, yeah. we might say, so that private life is at a discount, public life is what matters, being male is the most important thing if you're going to be a great warrior, and you eat together, you must have your evening meal together, and you fundamentally decide that you are a military society, yeah. if I can put it that way. So you said that obviously they're they communally, they live communally, but if you were a child going into yeah. this, uh, I'm not sure did you use the word, but it, it's a go guy, which means... Ah, a go gi, yes. yes. It means upbringing. Mm. Yeah. If you were a male child in this a what would your life be like and what kind of training right. would you receive? Well, the evidence for the, the system and indeed mm. the word is very much later. And this is generally true of pretty much everything mm. about Sparta. It's not really before the 5th century that we get much um, contemporary evidence good contemporary evidence. So we go back to the 7th century, but we think that things really are only attested much later. Mm -hmm. So the agogi, as we can reconstruct it from these later sources, works uh, on the following lines. A child is born and is deemed to be legitimate and worth rearing. For mm -hmm. the first six to seven years of his life, he lives within a private Spartan household, relating mainly to his mother because his dad spends most or all of his time away from home mm. living communally in a military style barracks age of seven the mother has to surrender mm. the boy to the public educational system which begins at seven and lasts until the age of 18 mm. Boys are organised in year groups, so people born between this festival and the next year's celebration of that festival. Mm. This is common to all Greeks. Mm. They organise their year in accordance with particularly important religious festivals. We don't happen mm. to know which one it was that was the beginning date for mm. a year. But So for the um, first sort of six years, um, it seems that they're mainly taught just to um, really survive in company. From the age of 13, they're taught more specific military skills, and possibly as late as then, it might have been earlier, mm. but they're taught basics of um, literacy yeah. and numeracy. And above all, they're, they're taught to be um, competitive. Mm. Um, this is, to our way of thinking, um, slightly odd, but mm. um, they would actually fight each other in play fights. Mm -hmm. But it might come to the point that one or other of them was killed. We actually hear of a guy who was killed, and the guy who killed him, who hadn't meant to kill him, um, was exiled. It was thought to be, you know, going too far to actually kill somebody that mm. you're, as it were, wrestling with mm. or whatever. Okay. And how was the, you, you talked a little, obviously, that they go into the Agoge, they live communally. Was there sort of a, a hierarchical structure to the Agoge, or was it just sort of everyone in together? Everyone in together, but it's overseen by a, a boy herd, is the literal translation. So um, a young man between the age of 20 and 30, and that man is responsible to the board of ephors, who are the mm. chief officials elected annually in in a funny procedure by shouting the candidates processed in front of the assembly and the assembly shouted and then judges who were out of sight of the candidates so theoretically had no idea which candidate was whom mm. um, uh, judged which were the the biggest shouts mm. anyway there were five efforts a year and they were in charge of pretty much all aspects of mm. Spartan life therefore including the agogi mm. now within the agogi there were various tests well if you were better at them, you know, then you start to get the emergence of a kind of elite. Mm. And if you were very bad at them, then at the end there's a risk that you don't actually become a Spartan, because having gone all the way through mm. to the age of 18, you then have to get elected to a mess, a mm. dining group, a barracks. Well, if for any reason you're not selected by any mess whatsoever, mm. then you don't become a citizen. I see. Yeah. Now, you, so that actually feeds in quite well. So you're you're there and you're in the agoge until you are eighteen. Yeah. 
um, and then you move into this mess. Now, what kind of military training would you undergo to become a Spartan, or w- as you yes, were a Spartan? There's um, very little in the way of detailed evidence. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any source which says, right, I'm now going to give you a systematic description of the agogi. Mm-hmm. You just get references to the fact there is one. Mm-hmm. That's very odd by Greek standards because most Greek cities did not have public educational mm-hmm. systems at all. And the only one feature that um, sticks out in all the evidence is a particular contest which took place between um, teams, presumably within the same year group. Mm -hmm. And they're down by the Eurotas River, Mm -hmm. and there's a plane tree grove. Plane trees grow near rivers. And the point of it was to push back. one. You've got the plane trees behind you, the river in front of you. Mm -hmm. Two teams meet, and one team has to push the other Mm -hmm. one. One's trying to get the others back into the plane tree woods. The others are trying to get Mm -hmm. the other guys into the river Mm. and that's just about all we know in detail Mm. about what the agogi um, entailed apart from um, the odd question we're told that there was a question and answer element and if for any reason the boy failed to answer the question or answered it um, badly then there were punishments that could be inflicted okay now again ancient Greece I suppose to contextualize things a bit it was quite patriarchal and men were sort of ruling everything and the man would be head of the household. With all the men of Sparta constantly away from the household, how was it that Spartan society managed to support itself and sort of keep things going if half the population or maybe just under or just over half was missing? No, I think that's a very good question and the um, ancient sources are aware of this. Most of the sources for Sparta are not Spartan. So in other words, they look at Sparta and think, yeah, this is odd, our men don't behave like that Mm -hmm. and therefore our women don't behave like Spartan women. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is that Spartan girls were treated uh, much more equally with the boys than was the case in other Mm. cities. They were fed um, pretty much the same amount of food and Mm. probably type of food. They were required to take part in physical exercises in public Mm. in a way that was thought to be most um, improper Mm. for young girls in other cities. And so when they came to the marriageable age, and they married relatively later, they were more nearly equal to their um, husbands than was the case in other cities Mm. where girls were married off at 13, 14 to men in their late 20s. You know, they might be twice as old as their brides. Mm. So while the men were away, either on campaign or just simply doing their normal exercises and eating in the barracks and so on, who's running the house? Well, uh, in two ways. Um, the, The women, the wives were running the households and that's quite interesting because they are regarded that's regarded as an admirable feature to be Mm -hmm. a good housekeeper but interestingly unlike any other greek wives they did no work in the Mm -hmm. same way that the spartan men did no productive work no agriculture no craftsmanship Mm. they just did what well the spartan women didn't either Mm. uh, cook bake sew um, men because they had unfree helot women to help them out in the house. Mm. Uh, Greeks, but unfree, they spoke the same language, they worshipped the same gods and goddesses, uh, but they had been conquered and they were treated as a conquered subordinate people. The Mm. nearest equivalent that's often been raised is the apartheid system in South Africa, where you have a native black population that's subjugated by an Mm. incoming white one. Well, in some ways, the Spartan Helot relationship was a bit like that. And how many, to put it in proportion, for every one Spartan, how many helots would there be? We have one figure, and this is of course applying only to males, which compares the two. When Spartans went out to fight against the Persians at the Battle of Patea, there were 5,000 adult male Spartan soldiers, and each one of them had seven helots. Mm. Um, Not directly in that way, each one took seven, but there were 35,000 helots Mm. and there were 5,000 Spartans. And it's thought that might be a rough approximation. So let's say there were at that time something like 9,000 
adult male Spartans. That would make a population of Spartans plus their families mm. of something of the order of 30 to 40,000. Well, multiply that by seven and you get up to something mm. like 250. Two, I mean, that's large, but it's not absolutely mm. impossible. That sort of order of magnitude. Mm. And this is, brings us into the other point. Obviously, they had this subjugation of, as I'm, I understand it, it, was the surrounding tribes, wasn't it? Where well, local peoples um, organised not on a city-state basis, but um, as tribal is perhaps one way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. So you have this, this, these subjugated tribes that are serving. Helots was what, what they're called. But other than that, the Spartans hated anyone well they they, yeah. hate, they hated the other they hated the foreigners anyone who wasn't spartan or wasn't a helot was kept pretty much nearly out of the borders they're yeah. kicked out i think they have a ceremony of I'll let, let you talk about that why was sparta so xenophobic in nature i think it is because their hold over their helots was relatively fragile and of course famously the helots did on more than one occasion some of them actually revolt mm. uh, rise up and eventually they did um, with outside help revolt um, significant numbers of them into freedom they actually got liberated from their spartan masters so i think it's partly if you're in a closed community where you have very distinctive customs and you don't wish them to be contaminated. Mm-hmm. You're slightly frightened. You're not very familiar with what other people do. Yeah. And you have a very strong community. It's not mm-hmm. a weak community. Aided by geography, Sparta has, in northern frontiers, very conveniently mountainous mm-hmm. and uh, surrounded by sea, but there aren't many good sea ports. So mm-hmm. it's actually a very difficult place to either come into and out of on a mm-hmm. regular basis or to attack, to invade. Mm-hmm. So... Um, Interestingly, the Spartans, um, unlike other Greeks who called non-Greeks barbarians and called Greeks who were not from their community, Mm. they had another word, xenoi, where we get xenophobia Mm. from. Well, the Spartans called not only um, other Greeks xenoi, but they called all um, barbarians xenoi as well. Mm. So they collapsed the distinction between non-Greek foreigners Mm. and Greek foreigners. They were were literally xenophobic because they Mm -hmm. feared all Mm. non-Spartans. So they feared everyone outside of the borders and they kept everything to themselves. How did the city structure itself politically how was how what was the right. hierarchy like well i mentioned earlier they had a very odd system they had two kings but those kings were not autocrats they weren't as it were homeric kings who had freedom to do what they wanted to do they were part of a political system which was structured in two main ways uh, at the very top the elite the policy makers, if you like, the decision makers, were men typically uh, very elderly by by Greek standards, over 60. Mm. And they'd been elected to a council, quite literally a senate. I mean, the word senate comes from the Latin word meaning an old man. Mm. So a senate of 28 plus the two kings, regardless of their age, Mm. so that you might have a 25-year-old king, but all the other non-royal members were over 60. Mm. Well, these guys deliberated, uh, they took counsel and pre-deliberated issues, which the assembly of all the Spartan warriors would listen to once a month. There was a regular assembly Mm. meeting. And on matters at any rate of peace and war, in other words, should we be at war or should we be at peace with this particular people, the Spartans collectively decided as warriors at an assembly at which they were invited to express their opinion, not by voting individually, Mm. by raising their hands or putting a stone in a pot. Mm. They were invited to shout And this was the method, I think I mentioned already, Mm. that they chose their um, ephors were chosen by shouting, the Mm. senators were chosen by shouting. And the um, policy decisions, Mm. for example, shall we fight the Athenians, shall we make peace with the Athenians, that would be decided by an overall shout. Mm. 
Okay, and you mentioned there that they have two kings. Right. How does that fit into the society? How, what is the role of those two kings? Kings are, by definition, aristocrats. They must be, or must claim to be, descended, quite literally, by blood, from the descendants of Heracles, Hercules, who founded the city. Mm. And they are kings for life. They have to have a regent if they're underage, if they're less than 20, but they, after the age of 20... Mm. They are the automatic commanders of any army, whether Spartan alone or allied Spartan army. There are two of them, so there's a bit of a jockeying between mm. them, which one should lead which campaign. Mm. And sometimes, actually, they divided on policy lines. I mean, you might get the case where one of the kings was very bellicose, couldn't wait to lead out an army mm. to smash some enemy. And the other guy was in favour of negotiated diplomacy. Mm. And then they would fall out with each other. Then that's where the assembly would come mm. in and actually arbitrate between mm. two rival royal mm. um, positions. So they have two kings, they have the air force at the top, and then they have everyone else sort of communally at the bottom. How, in terms of every Greek state, obviously, was mad about religion, but to the Spartans, how important was religion? Well, interestingly, Herodotus, the, the best earliest source for the Spartan system in general, he twice says something like the Spartans um, rated the things of the gods above the things of men. Well, all Greeks did that. Mm. So what's he getting at? Well, what he means is that they were particularly hot on what you or I might even call superstition, but religion. So so, for example, can we fight now? Oh, dear, no. The phase of the moon is wrong. Mm. Can we fight now? Oh, dear, no. This is a holy month um, dedicated to Apollo, mm. and we're not allowed to fight at all. So there is a famous case, um, Battle of Marathon. The Athenians send an... Uh, a delegate from uh, Athens, he's actually a runner, mm. and he gets to Sparta and says, you know, time is of the essence, send us help now. Uh, and they say, well, we're all in favour of what you're doing. We agree we should uh, resist the Persians. Unfortunately, the phase of the moon, <laughs> yeah. And so they arrive the day after the Battle of Marathon. Well, it's yeah. quite a major thing to miss the Battle of Marathon because of a religious yeah. view. And that wasn't the last yeah. time that that um, happened. Yeah. The another thing, so I just no, no, mentioned, sorry, <laughs> yeah, this is a general point about religion, that um, the way they regarded, they represented their gods and goddesses. Um, as you know, famously, the Greeks' religion was anthropomorphic, so they imagined their gods as looking like them, only bigger, better, more beautiful, stronger, mm. whatever. So... In Sparta, every god and goddess was represented in armour. Mm. Now, think about it. Aphrodite, the goddess of sex, um, goddess of um, private and um, peaceful sex. Mm. She's not a great warrior. Famously in uh, Homer, she goes on the battlefield once and is pathetic, mm. sort of feeble woman, mm. and goes off because she can't be killed because she's an immortal, but she goes off weeping, you know. So um, Sparta was odd in that respect. Mm -hmm. Now, to bring that back, you, you just talk, mentioned Aphrodite there, and you did talk about the role of women mm. slightly earlier on. Yeah. So maybe if we start, then reopen the discussion of women, to talk about the practice of marriage, reproduction, and childbirth in Sparta. Yeah. Now, there's an issue here which we can't resolve for sure, but every other Greek city, it was the men who decided um, which man, a particular woman, that's to say typically a girl, 13, 14, was to be married to. And it's not impossible. There's some you know, feeling in the, in the sources that perhaps Spartan girls had a bit of a say in who they married. When they married, they um, came... Without a dowry, which interestingly, uh, in all other Greek cities, um, the woman, the, the bride, typically brought a dowry to the marriage. Well, Spartan women owned their own um, private property. They had their own clothes, their own um, implements and so on. They could even own land. Mm. So, the, as I said before, the relationship between a Spartan man and a Spartan woman in marriage was much mm. more equal and similar mm. than was the case, uh, for example, in Athens. Mm -hmm. 
The purpose of marriage, now this was a common thing, it's not peculiar to Sparta, though they made a big thing of it, was to reproduce. In other words, mm -hmm. to produce, ideally, a male, uh, initially at any rate, to be a warrior. Mm -hmm. And a lot of emphasis was placed on the uh, education of the woman to be fit, I mean physically fit, so that she could bear the rigours of childbirth and produce strong, healthy mm -hmm. uh, offspring. Okay, and sorry, we're moving along to talk. Obviously, they are famous for their work on the battlefield. They are the warrior state. How many fighting men at any one time in Spartan history would there have been approximately? Obviously, it's a yeah. few hundred year period. But uh, Well, I mentioned earlier the Battle of Plataea, which is where we actually get a figure of 5,000 going mm. out, out of a total available of 8,000. Mm. Another source says once upon a time there were 9,000. Mm. What's very striking is that after that uh, high point of about 479 BC, within a century, the number of uh, full adult male Spartan citizens had dropped. By 400, it was down to about three to 4,000. Mm. By 370, it was down to about 1,500. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Is it a failure to reproduce? Is it something to do with the fact they suffered a major uh, population disaster, like a tsunami recently hit mm -hmm. um, Japan? Mm -hmm. So there was a huge loss of life in the 460s, mm -hmm. and then it took them very long. They never quite recovered from the loss there because mm -hmm. it killed young men or even teenagers who then would have become fathers but mm. were just wiped out mm. or is it something to do with the uh, economic system that's to say of inheritance that um, they're trying not to have too many children so that their property doesn't get divided the common plots that they inherit uh, you know these are unknowns mm. um, there, there are a lot of um, puzzling features of mm. Sparta and this is one of the most puzzling yeah. Aristotle who was a contemporary of the 4th century Spartans said that um, the one factor that really did for them we're going to come on to this later mm. how come Sparta having once been so powerful ceased to be mm. it was the shortage of adult male military manpower mm. which did for them that's what Aristotle yeah. says so we couldn't and this opens up the discussion about military we could not talk about Sparta the Spartans or even the Spartan military without mentioning the battle that really earned them their eternal fame, partly because of that film, although I would not advocate <laughs> it. Yeah. And that is the Battle of Thermopylae. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about the Battle of Thermopylae and then uh, its significance to Spartan history? One of the puzzles is that uh, it's generally regarded as a heroic um, battle, and you typically celebrate heroic battles that are victories. Mm. But of course this one, though the Spartans resisted terrifically mm. against overwhelming odds, they actually, in the end, um, were defeated. So mm. Thermopylae is a defeat, but it's gone down in legend for the notion, the thought, that the Spartans committed people just to make the point that the cause of Greece, freedom of Greece from Persian occupation was so important that the Spartan state is willing to sacrifice some of its greatest warriors mm -hmm. to die for the cause. Well, since they didn't stop the Persians, what was the point of it? Well, it was to hold them up mm -hmm. so that the fleet could regroup so that they could um, have some sort of breathing mm. space. The Persians have come down like a great juggernaut and they, the, the Greeks resisting them needed to have some sort of um, stand. Mm. And then looking back, the Spartans could always say, look what we did, come on you guys, be like us. Okay. And I think it was a morale victory that was the essential point of it. Mm. Now, there's a huge emphasis on the fact that it was not the full Spartan force, it was famously King yeah. Leonidas and his 300. Yeah. Were there really just 300? Were there helots with them? Was there anyone right. else? 300 Spartans selected on the basis partly that they all had living sons, mm. so that when, uh, as was predicted, most or all of them were killed, their bloodline, their family line would continue and there'd be Spartan boys growing up. My dad was one of the Thermopylae mm. dead, you know. But um, 
Very importantly, thereafter, the Spartans um, had to make, obviously, as far as they could, some sort of um, effort to show that the victory that was going to come. And you mentioned the helots. Well, typically, every Spartan uh, would have at least one helot to mm-hmm. be his Batman, to mm-hmm. cook for him, look after his equipment and all that. We have a source which mentions a figure something like a thousand. Mm-hmm. And they actually, a couple of them are given, um, in a way, starring roles because um, one of them um, developed a very bad eye um, infection, yet was so determined to be there at the finish and to die, in fact, in the pass, that um, his helot had to guide him into the battle because he couldn't see. Mm -hmm. So um, they do have a bit of a role there. Mm -hmm. However, in addition to the Spartans, a group of people living within the Spartan state that we've not mentioned yet, and they're called dwellers round about, perioikoi. They're free, they live in their own communities, they're not helots, but they're not Spartans either. Well, there were uh, a good number of them at Thermopylae as well, mm-hmm. so it wasn't just 300 Spartans, but perhaps altogether um, we're getting on to over a thousand mm-hmm. um, Laconians of various sorts. Mm-hmm. Now, the Greco-Persian War is obviously Thermopylae and then the Persian th- threat is sort of expelled in about 478 BC and the period between 478 and 431 is often called the 50 year period. First of all what is the 50 year period and what happens to Sparta during that period? I mean, what's its significance? Yeah. Well, the significance of it is that um, the victory over the Persians, quite unexpected, had been the result of a combination of two very different forces and alliances. First, the Spartans, and secondly, the Athenians. Spartans by land, the Athenians by sea. Well, the issue after it was there are still Greeks within the Persian Empire. Mm. We've resisted them adding to their empire, so they've not got any of us Mm. in mainland Greece. But what about our brothers and sisters in uh, what they called Asia? Mm. That's Asia Minor, that's Western Turkey today. Mm. The Spartans eventually, and there's a bit of an attempt to carry on the struggle, but after about a year or so, they took the view that they weren't suitably equipped, they weren't a naval power, they weren't going to be able Mm. to take the Persian Empire on. The Athenians, conversely, they built up a new alliance, a naval alliance, they had um, tribute paid, and they took on the Persians, and Mm. indeed for the next 20 to 30 years, they devoted themselves to liberating any Greeks who were subjects of Persia, Mm -hmm. all around the Eastern Aegean, and then secondly to keeping them free from Persia in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's one um, line which the Athenians peddled, which they'd actually made a deal, a peace treaty with the great king of Persia himself to keep out of the Greek sphere that they claimed that the Persian king swore not to interfere with Greeks anymore. Mm. Well, whether he did or not, that's the essence of the um, Pentaconte to the 50-year period. Mm. Now, suppose you're a Spartan and you had been top dog. Along comes the Athenians and they build up what um, can be regarded as a kind of empire Mm. in the Aegean. Well, Fine if the Aegean is all the Athenians are interested and they have no connections with the Peloponnese. There was unfortunately um, a sort of tipping point because one of the cities that was an ally of um, Sparta, Corinth, also had a subordinate, a, a colony we call it, that was a member of the Athenians' alliance. And there was an issue and a a pressure point. Mm. And the Spartans had to decide whether they just let it go, that Mm. the Athenians would treat this um, colony of their ally, Corinth, uh, in a way that Corinth deemed unacceptable, or whether they were going to fight the Athenians. Mm. And eventually they decided that Athens' growing power was threatening their own alliance Mm. in such a way that they had to do something about it. And so breaks out what we call the Peloponnesian War, the Athena-Peloponnesian War, Mm. which dominates the rest of what we call the 5th century for Mm. getting on for 30 years, 27-year war, on and off. On and off. Yeah. Okay. 
So the Peloponnesian War breaks out in 431, am I yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Thereabouts. Now, the war rages on, there's battles and everything. But there's a very, very strange and a very non-Spartan thing happens in 425 BC at the siege of, now am I going to pronounce this right, Sphacteria? Very good. Sphacteria. Sphacteria is an islet, a little island off the west coast of the southern Peloponnese. And it's within Sparta's city territory, which is enormous. I mean, it's the biggest city territory of any Greek city in the, in the Greek world. And the Athenians decide that one of the best tactics that they have against the Spartans is to land troops within Spartan territory to threaten the Spartans from within, and in particular to encourage helots to rise up and join them to destabilize the Spartans mm -hmm. at home. And this actually works very well, and they occupy this islet. The mm -hmm. Spartans have no choice but to send a force to mm -hmm. try to boot the Athenians out. They land on this little island of Sphacteria, and things go horribly wrong. Um, the garrison of about 420 men finds itself surrounded by the Athenians and um, are put under a siege. Now, this is where the odd thing comes. There was a kind of myth since the Mopoli, that Spartans never give in. If they're in, involved in a military situation, they will do and die. If they don't win, they'll die. But these guys decided that they were going to surrender. Mm -hmm. And they surrendered and they were therefore captured and they were taken as hostages back to Athens where they remained until Athens and Sparta made a temporary peace four years later. But it was a major episode threatening them the sort of um, idea of Sparta as invincible. Yeah, and did they give, I mean, it's so non-Spartan, did they give a reason for why they surrendered? Um, the interesting, there's a source, but the source is, of course, Athenian, it's Thucydides. Mm -hmm. They allegedly, the men on the island who were trapped, they sent a message to the authorities in Sparta, what should we do? And the Spartan authorities, they didn't exactly wash their hands of it. What they said was, only do what is in the best interests of Sparta. Well, that's ambiguous. <laughs> you know, what do you decide? So anyway, they decided to save their lives. So the Spartan authorities had to live with the fact that in Athens were about um, a couple of hundred of um, really um, quite important Spartan warriors, and they were held hostage for the good behavior. And the Spartans actually never again invaded Athenian territory, mm. which had been their main tactic, until they made a truce in order to get the men um, back to mm. Sparta. It was very important. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm very sorry to have to sort of push the Peloponnesian War so quickly to the side. Sure. But there's so much to get in. How does the Peloponnesian War play out and then how does it end? Well, there's a, a temporary break, a kind of phony peace in mm. 421. So there's been 10 years of fighting, really quite nasty, all around the Aegean. But then the Athenians um, go through a phase where they, they start to get aggressive. They reckon they're so invincible at sea that they can start sending expeditions around. And they, in 414, send, in order to help one of their allies, who is Sparta's enemy in the mm -hmm. Peloponnese, Argos, they invade the territory of the Spartans. Mm -hmm. That is a casus belli. The Spartans, the following year, 413, decide they're going to renew the war the Athenians have broken the truce and what they do is they do two things one they go off to Persia this is a bit of a shock mm. uh, why because they need money in order to develop a fleet because the only way you're going to beat Athens mm -hmm. is at sea and then the other thing they do is they send a force to occupy this is the counterpart of what the Athenians did at Sphacteria. They send a force to occupy a place within Athens' mm -hmm. territory. It's a place called Decelia or Decelia today. Mm -hmm. And they remain there from 413 for the next, um, the, the war ends finally in 404. So for nine years you've got this occupying fort within mm -hmm. Athenian territory. And the war ends essentially because the Persian money 
builds up a sufficiently powerful fleet eventually to defeat the Athenian fleet mm. in one of the kind of choke points. Mm. And this is actually the Hellespont, what we call mm. the Dardanelles. And it's through there that grain, especially wheat, comes mm. from Ukraine and Crimea. The Athenians had a very big population, much too big to be supported mm. by its own local farmland. Yeah. So they imported lots of grain. Yeah. And once that's cut off, then they starve. Yeah. Sorry, and just before we move on from the Peloponnesian War, you mentioned something there that I think we, we do need to bring up. The fact that the Persians are now actually funding the Spartans yeah. because they were sort of, they hated them. Like they, they, they fought and they held out in the pass of Thermopylae for a few days and yes. proved that Xerxes, the king at the time, was not invincible. Why then do they suddenly start going and funding the Persian or the, the Spartans? The Spartans. So? Well, it's because they hated the Athenians even more than the Spartans. That's, it's the old, my enemy's enemy mm -hmm. is my friend. So um, Spartans are their friend because they're the enemy of the Athenians. Mm -hmm. And the Spartans were regarded by the Persians, correctly, I think, as less mm -hmm. of a threat because they are not a maritime power. They're unlikely to be able to sustain a presence in the Aegean that would threaten the Persians' control mm. of Asia. And after the Peloponnesian War, what happens is the Spartans take over the Athenians' role. That commits them. They, they probably should have realized this. They were bound eventually, actually, to come up against the Persians, who would want them out, um, you know, not having anything mm. to do. But Spartans begin by sending an expedition, mm. actually, into Asia. And at one point, a king of Sparta is fighting in Asia, it comes to nothing. The Persians are able to develop a fleet um, manned by Greeks and commanded by an Athenian because, of course, now it's the other way around. The Spartans are our enemies, so our enemy's enemy, Athens, mm. is our friend. And a big naval victory for this Athenian-led yeah. fleet means the Spartans give up and the um, Persians recover um, their possessions uh, in the mid-380s. Mm. It's a rather sort of shameful episode in Greek history, actually. And then, obviously, so the Peloponnesian War ends, Sparta establishes itself as sort of the Greek city-state. When and why does Sparta go into decline? It's a very big question. It's um, like, you know, the origins of the First World War and so on. Mm. But... Um, what's puzzling, uh, in a way, is uh, it's as if they'd gone to... They sort of overreach. After the Peloponnesian War, right, we've got rid of Athens, we take over from where the Athenians are, we'll start raising tribute, we'll have a fleet, and they do too much. I mentioned the invasion of um, actual Asia and therefore fighting Persians on land in Asia. This is an extraordinary mm. thing. Now, we know about Alexander the Great, but this is mm. um, long in the future. So the Spartans um, seem to extend their resources beyond what they are capable of sustaining. So they develop um, a, a big fleet, that, that fails. They then start to develop a land empire outside the Peloponnese, as far north as Olynthos, which is on the borders of Macedon. Mm. And so they're extended right across the, the southern Balkan peninsula until, and then uh, it's really quite a sudden and sharp decline. I mentioned the decline in numbers mm. of Spartans. That's a bit of a worry. You'd have thought they'd start thinking, well, we're losing men. Can we sustain this um, very strong form of almost imperialist um, extension of our power outside, but rather than hanging on to what we've got? Well, from the um, beginning of the 370s, the Athenians get together an alliance and now the the um, Greek the, the Persians are, are supporting um, them against the Spartans, and um, the power that rises up uh, in addition to Athens in Maine and Greece is Thebes, and eventually it's um, a defeat in battle, a pitched battle between Thebes and its allies, who include Athens, mm. and um, the Spartans and their allies. Battle of Leuctra, mm. three seven one. The Spartans, for the first time, really, lose a major pitched battle. I mean, possibly the first time ever, or the first time for a couple of hundred, maybe even 300 years, mm. they lose a major pitched battle. Mm. And then suddenly it's as if everybody... Um, it's like the emperor's new clothes. People think, 
we've been under the Spartans all this time, but they're actually not that powerful. Well, one of the symptoms of the lack of power is that Thebans get together a major expeditionary force, come down into the Peloponnese from central Greece, and actually liberate half the helots, the Mycenaean helots, rise up when the uh, Theban force gets into that mm. part of um, the Peloponnese. And the Spartans never can get them back. And so why does Sparta become a second-rate power? It loses a significant amount of its actual territory and its helot base. Mm -hmm. Now, OK, so they sort of start to go into decline and... Uh the empire sort of winds itself down. Move on now, just moving towards the end, to talk a little bit about Sparta's legacy. Something that comes up all the time uh, when you hear of Sparta are these Spartan sayings or these little anecdotal yeah, tales yeah, about... Yeah. Personally, my favourite is the one about Philip of Macedon marching <laughs> his armies further south, and he sends a messenger to Sparta and say, if we beat you on the battlefield, we will destroy you, we will rape your women, we will do this, that, and yeah, the other, yeah. burn you to the ground. <laughs> and they send back a one-word reply, and that is, if. Yeah. There, but there's all these other ones, and how true are some of them, if you want to tell one or two yourself? I think there was an industry, rather like, um, you know, shaggy dog stories and Kerry Man mm. jokes and so on. People make them <laughs> up. They're not um, authentic. Mm. Um, but um, the word laconic, our word laconic, comes from um, the adjective of the Spartans, who are the Lacedaemonians, the mm. Laconians, Laconicos, Laconic mm. means people who have very um, sharp, short, witty utterances. Mm. And that is a characteristic thing. But you're quite right to look at it in terms of the legacy, because though Sparta, as an active um, power, declines, it, it becomes a second rate mm. um, wrangler, really. Mm. Its myth, its story, grows in proportion to its decline. So it becomes terribly famous for what it once was and what it stands for. And the other Greeks, um, especially when the, per the sorry, not the Persian now, but the Romans come along mm. and conquer Greece as they do from the second century onwards. Well, more and more Greeks become nostalgic, and they look back to their glory days and the most glorious days was when the Greeks, that is the Spartans and the Athenians and their allies, defeated the Persians mm. in 485. So there's a big industry of recreating or inventing mm. this wonderful golden age past, and the Spartans are absolutely central yeah. to that. But I, I, this is a slightly out-of-place question, but I just think it would be interesting. Out of all those sort of unusual stories or sayings, which one's your favourite? Um, I suppose it would be the um, thing that um, allegedly Leonidas said just before they're going finally, um, the 300, they're at Thermopylae, and he says, right, eat a hearty breakfast, as it were, because tonight we're going to dine in Hades. Now, in Hades, Hades means the unseen. It's the after, it's the nether world mm -hmm. where people aren't embodied. They're, they're flitting sort of like bats. Uh, you don't eat in Hades at all. <laughs> um, the point is to make to the spot is a kind of gallows humour. So that's one that I mm. like. On the women's side, now this is a fact about um, the perception of Spartan women as being strong and independent and mm. having something to say. There are a number of sayings, Spartan-type sayings, which are attributed to women. And one of them, uh, it's a slightly puzzling one, a non-Spartan woman comes up to the wife of, Gor of Leonidas. Her name is Gorgo, mm. and says, we've heard that you women in Sparta rule your men and how come because this is the world turned upside mm. down she replies because we are the only um, women in Greece who produce real men <laughs> now she's not answering the question she's saying that we yes we may or may not rule them but your men they aren't even men at least our men mm -hmm. our children our sons are real men so it's a, a sort of tough assertion yeah. of um, spot Mm. 
So the sayings live on. They're this sort of uh, yeah, yeah. This they, this thing that they all hark back to. They and they're say. preserved by Plutarch. Mm. Um, Plutarch wrote lots of biographies. Mm. He's the main source, for example, of Shakespeare. And people who um, studied ancient Greece, they would read their Plutarch, mm. and so they'd learn about Lycurgus. They'd learn about Agesilaus. There are a number of Spartan lives, and he's a key conduit of the Spartan myth or sometimes it's called mirage, sometimes it's just called the legend or tradition, which is very lively right down, one might say, even to the present day with, you mentioned the movie, which obviously you don't <laughs> like, 300, but it's part of the Spartan myth, which is still alive and well. I mean, we still, don't we, refer to certain types of behaviour as Spartan, mm. and we're in the middle of an austerity regime in this country. Mm. Well, that's said to be Spartan austerity, to live in an austere mm -hmm. way. Okay. Now, jumping forward a few thousand years, um, <laughs> just to glance over them, sort of push them to one side, how is Sparta received? Because obviously their politics are strange to, to even the Greeks at the time. How is Sparta received by political writers and reformers in sort of 18th to 20th century? Right, well, um, down to as far as the 18th and indeed into the 19th, there's still a very positive reception of them because what um, writers look for in a polity, in a mm. political system, is some sort of order, mm. some sort of coherence. And what they admired about the Spartans was the discipline, the fact that most Spartans, most of the time, um, if you like, towed the line, but that they were a homogeneous, self-confident, um, in their own eyes, progressive force, mm. which um, valued morality, that's to say self-sacrificing um, devotion to the common good. Mm. So political philosophers who thought that the goal of politics was to be virtuous in public as a community. The Spartans seem to embody virtue. More recently, we don't think military virtues are necessarily mm. the most important virtues. Mm. And we don't like the um, hierarchical mm. element of Sparta. We don't think it's great that the Spartans voted by shouting instead of by individual voting, which could be, cal you know, all these things. But I think the thing that most has discredited the Spartan tradition the Spartans in the more recent period, this is now a 20th century phenomenon, is that the Nazis mm. adopted the Spartans as their kind of spiritual ancestors and almost their physical ancestors. And so there's an awful lot mm. of um, appeal to Spartan education. Women were to produce children, especially mm. male, who were to be brought up by the community, mm. that private rights, individuality, was to be suppressed and in all these ways the Spartans were taken to be kind of ideal ancestors and that sadly has been taken up by other I would call them fascist groups and there's one in Greece today it's called Golden Dawn mm. and they actually hold rallies in Thermopylae and so they're kind of Nuremberg rallies mm. um, appalling in, in my opinion but it's one of the things I'm worried about if um, Greece fails as a state or if we pull out of Europe in the EU referendum and then Europe um, goes into uh, meltdown, well, these nationalist groups are going to rise up. And in Greece, that means this mm -hmm. particularly unpleasant Nazi-type, mm -hmm. um, Sparta-loving uh, Golden Dawn. Yeah. So, to wrap it all up and bring right. it all together, if everyone listening and I could only take three pieces of information about Sparta away from this podcast... What would they be? Well, the first would be, and this is a debate among us historians, which is just how different, if at all, or significantly different, Sparta was from your, if you like, average Greek city. Yeah. And I've mentioned a number of features. We've talked about um, the status of women. We've talked about the devotion to military factors. We've talked about a communal mm. education system that's state-run. Well, in all these ways, Sparta's was significant different mm. 
from any other Greek city. And we might talk about the exposure of infants mm. because the community is felt to be more important mm. than any individual family and so on. Mm. And um, the second point I've already just dwelt on, which is the tradition, the myth legend, mm. that down to fairly recently the Spartans were regarded actually as quite a sort of role model for how society should operate politically. Mm. And then um, thirdly, and this again is a point we've touched upon, that um, we use the word Spartan today and there are nice ways of using that and there are not nice ways. 300 you don't like, but it's relatively harmless except for its sort of xenophobia because it depicts the Persians mm. as sort of animals. That's one of my main problems. I, know, I, yeah, I yeah. dislike that intensely as well. Mm. But on the other hand, the notion of self-denial, of um, devotion to the community and so on, if, if it's done in a good way, that actually could be quite mm. a virtue. However, since it was taken up by a particular group of um, political ideologues, namely the Nazis, it's actually very hard now to project Sparta as a positive, progressive um, political ideal. Mm -hmm. And that brings us really nicely to the end of the podcast. Professor Cartledge, thank you so much for joining me today. I really, really enjoyed it. And for having me in into Clare College, we're sitting in one of the nicest libraries I think I've been in in my You're two in days. You're in the yeah. Fellows Library of Clare College. <laughs> it's absolutely so. beautiful. I might take a picture of it and stick it up um, on our Facebook page later on. But if you enjoyed hearing Professor Cartledge speak, all of his books, links to all of his books on Amazon will be available in the description. And if you enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more or get involved with Classical Youth Society of Ireland, you can contact us via our social media pages on www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society Ireland, Twitter at CYSI underscore, or for any direct inquiries, you can email us cysiofficial at gmail.com. Today's podcast was edited by Michael Fuller. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope to catch you all next time. 